So a warm welcome to this session on uh, market intelligence um, and how we learn more about BOP consumers and markets. Uh, I am Cecilia Vaverka, a member of the IEP team based in uh, Stockholm. I am uh, joined um, for this session by um, a number of panelists. It's a selection of companies um, from both the IEP um, and BIF programs. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy and pleased to uh, welcome uh, Mark Hamworth, uh, Rent to Own, uh, Lauren Thomas, Mozambikes, um, Macarand Sorte, uh, CropServe, and Bass Hoffman, uh, Text to Change. Um, and together we will try to look into these um, and explore a bit further the, the, the questions around um, how we can gather market intelligence around producers, suppliers, consumers, and, and learn more about what the um, people at the BOP, what they want, um, believe, and will trust in. Um, I'm going to start off with, with an introduction to sort of set the scene, um, and I will then ask the panelists to do um, five-minute brief presentations, and we'll end off with a Q&A session where I hope that um, you will be uh, sharing your uh, experiences and insights as well so that we can have a dynamic interaction. Um, right. So... Um, when we're looking at, at the BOP market and, and, and targeting the BOP market, there is an increased interest in, in doing this. Um, and, and part of the reason is that, that the BOP, uh, people at the BOP level are um, viewed more as um, resources rather than victims. So, so more as consumers and producers that actually have um, um, a demand and a need for, for affordable products and services. And obviously this means that there's an untapped market uh, that, that uh, provides uh, new opportunities. Um, and and when, when, when targeting this new kind of nascent market then there, there are often misconceptions about the needs um, and the demands and, and one sort of um, um, a common one may be that it's enough to slash prices to make a product affordable and then people will buy it. But the BOP is a lot more complex than that um, as a segment and they often uh, lack regular jobs, um, they have unpredictable salaries, uh, they're part of an informal economy which means that they don't have access to banking services as such. Um, and this means that, that their purchasing uh, decisions are based on a range of, of various factors. And obviously, affordability is one of them. But as we have discussed previously, um, trust, dignity, um, aspiration are also parts of, of what is um, um, difficult or important to focus on. Um, and so it becomes clear that in order to target this market effectively, we need to, to, um, to know more about um, the habits and everything that, that, that sort of lies behind um, the demand. So to give you a, an example of, of these kinds of assumptions that, that one can have about the needs and the wants, um, this, this is from a, um, a shanty town in, in, in Mumbai where uh, people cannot afford buying a house or um, getting access to running water. So this, and this is something that they accept, this reality they accept, and what they, um, how they, they um, um, sort of go about their daily lives then is to spend money on things that they um, can get now. So what may then seem like counterintuitive choices um, is logical based on, on their reality. Um, and some, some examples here is that, that a large um, percentage have television sets, um, pressure cookers and gas stoves, maybe more, um, not so surprising that, that people would buy, but then also telephones, obviously, that a large share of, of, of people own. Um, and, and looking at habits that actually shape demands. There is a, in a recent um, UNDP human development report, um, 
from the Philippines, there is an example of local habits where the poor households, uh, they prefer, in Manila, they prefer buying water from uh, middlemen, which obviously is, is quite expensive um, because they cannot afford the initial cost of actually setting up house connections. So what sort of, in the long term, what they actually, what they spend on water becomes really expensive as opposed to if they could have had the, the sort of piped water supply. Um, but but their, um, the habits and, and how their, their income works, they, they wouldn't be able to afford that initial cost. So a possible solution in this, in this um, case would obviously be to, to introduce some kind of payment mo model that, that could take care of that initial cost and maybe split it up into installments, um, what not, in order to, 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 um, to set up a piped water supply. And this sort of this example shows us that in order to come up with solutions to tackle um, the, the provision of such basic um, services and, and, and needs um, at an affordable price, we need to learn more about the habits and how they shape the demand at the BOP level. Um, so, so some questions stemming um, from, from this introduction and, and, and some that we'd like to, to um, dig a little deeper into um, is what, what information it is that we actually need about the BOP market, um, what the key challenges are in understanding the BOP consumers and markets and how they can be overcome um, and where resources and knowledge can be found. So, this, this shows a, it's a feasibility study uh, produced by, um, it's an Oxfam affiliate in, in the Netherlands in 2012 that, that shows that um, the information that, that primarily is needed, if we look at the sort of big, larger chunks of the pie chart, um, they represent uh, local habits and practices. Uh, also, the structure of distribution channels and, and value chains. Um, contacts in the field and the capacities of, of these contacts and links, um, as well as um, social and environmental issues. So, so if you look at these, the, the, um, the various items combined, we can see that, that an, an understanding and more information about the local context is something that, in, at least in this study, came up as sort of key. Um, and there are other for us that, that discuss uh, the same issue and, and how to gain insights about BOP consumers. Um, and an, so an example of this is um, it's the BOP summit that took place recently um, in the US in October, um, which gathered around 200 leaders in, um, um, in the corporate, non-profit, development and entrepreneurial worlds. Um, to discuss these, these issues and, and in, in relation to understanding the BOP, some of the conclusions that they came up with was, was what we have just looked into, that understanding um, the local context is key um, to building these sustainable ventures. And it's important to sort of go there and be there and, and, and let go of one's own values and context. Uh, and rather show a willingness to, to learn and understand. Um, and and when, when you've reached that level, it's important to let um, the local context actually help drive uh, the project. And, and that can be done by including local leaders and, and um, harnessing local entrepreneurial um, talents. Um, and if we continue looking at um, some actors that can actually, um, in this space, that uh, could be helpful in providing uh, market intelligence, obviously NGOs that work closely um, to the local communities, they, um, they are very well placed in terms of both economic social mapping, um, understanding local habits, um, as well as mapping um, local distribution chains. So, so they're, a valuable sort of stakeholder and actor in, in this space. Um, and other um, examples are innovative local ICT related players that would provide market research and other um, related services. 
um, and as well as universities, experts, anthropologists uh, that actually that do have the local wisdom and, and know-how that they can share. And, and obviously women play an important role in, in this um, aspect as well, uh, being very close to, um, to the, um, um, to where money is handled on a daily basis and, and, and knowing very well um, the, the habits of, of the local communities. So just some quick examples of, of um, some actors that are out there and that do BOP market research and intelligence. Um, the Emerging Future Labs, for instance, it's um, an organization that, that was founded in India and they are currently looking into, um, based on, on the sort of the success of the prepaid model in the uh, uh, banking industry, um, they are uh, focusing on um, how to deal with, with uncertainties in the BOP um, uh, income that they um, um, uh, experience and how, how the BOP manage uh, their assets. Um, and this is obviously in order to gain um, insights on, on consumer behavior at the BOP level. Um, Histra is another example. It's a global consulting firm that usually works in in um, um, consortiums of public, private sector, uh, local communities to research various issues. Um, and they, they've come out with quite a few practitioner guides uh, on, on different topics. And, and one of the ones mentioned here is um, a guide on how to, to capture the opportunities uh, to leverage ICT um, in, um, in the BOP um, in, in sectors such as education, health, and agriculture. And last but not least, um, I need to, to obviously shed light on, again, on the, um, on the IEP um, and also BIF uh, knowledge sharing um, um, tool that we have, the Practitioner Hub, which is a web-based tool with um, uh, a lot of resources in the, whole, in the sort of inclusive business space and, and how to reach um, BOP markets. And, and I really encourage you to, to, to visit because there, there are lots of, of publications that are very helpful. We have this, uh, the spotlights, which, you, which are, are um, uh, pictures of those up to the, to the uh, left there. And uh, one of the, the latest um, uh, publications looked at designing products and services for illiterate users, which, which is a, um, a very sort of um, um, important area, obviously, to, in, in, in this market. So um, I really encourage you to look at the blogs and publications. There are also various checklists um, for people involved in inclusive uh, business ventures, uh, such as how to reach the rural consumer if you're investor ready. And they give you a list of, of various points to, uh, to, to sort of tick off when you're um, developing your uh, your projects. And there are also networks uh, on the uh, practitioner hub based on sector and country as well, so that you can look into um, the country or specific sectors that you're interested in. I think I'll, I'll wrap things up here and I will um, hand over the floor to the, uh, uh, to the panelists. And um, I've, I've asked them to uh, to try to keep the five-minute uh, um, limit in order for us to be able to have a, um, a discussion afterwards. So um, I think we'll start off with, with Mark Hem Hemsworth, um, who represents Rent to Own, uh, which is um, a company based in, in Zambia, focused on, on supporting rural entrepreneurs um, for them to increase their income um, by supplying productive assets together with financing and, and training services. Please, Mark. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. I think uh, your, a lot of the findings in the reports were pretty spot on um, based on what I've seen in the past. So um, it's good to see those materials being produced. Uh, so a few years ago, I came to Zambia, about six years ago, and the the kind of the market solution that I had uh, come up with to help 
more entrepreneurs in rural Zambia just happened to be the one thing that seemed to be impossible. Um, it was to provide financing to small smallholder farmers and small businesses in rural Zambia. Um, and everyone that I talked to, uh, especially who knew Zambia very well, was, yeah, it's impossible. It's not going to work. Um, you're crazy. And so kind of the, the market intelligence component to to our business is is very fundamental and uh, I think I'll, I'll hopefully share some of the insights that we've learned over the past few years and uh, definitely happy to take questions. So, uh, so yeah, my name is Mark Hemsworth. Uh, I started rent own three years ago with uh, a colleague who was here uh, a few minutes ago, um, a co-founder who is from uh, a rural area in Zambia, uh, in northwestern province. Now, uh, the mission or the, the goal of Rent to Own is to connect these rural entrepreneurs to the assets, the productive assets that they need. Um, that started out with uh, ox carts, it uh, molded into more of an equipment based business. Um, and what we've learned along the way is that we have to provide not only the financing. Uh, but also the, the delivery, the training, um, and the ongoing support during the contract to make sure that these entrepreneurs are going to be successful. Um, this is quite different than what other, uh, other organizations are offering in terms of financing. Um, usually it is just financing. Um, and even at that, it's quite difficult to access that financing. So another part of our model that's very important is for us to be in the field to have uh, to have a local agent who is trusted in the community to work with these entrepreneurs so that they can see that there is access to this uh, to this service so uh, we combine um, all those services and the way that we address the market intelligence piece of our business was to actually live in the community um, with with our clients um, that's how the business started. Um, I think uh, this is my colleague, my co-founder Chico. This is us interviewing uh, a few years ago. You can tell my hair is a bit shorter. Um, and from there we built the business. So uh, the, next, the next thing to do was, and so this, this we keep with us, uh, this idea of working very closely with uh, the communities that we operate in. Um, but in the last year, we've really had to change how we, how we operate because this wasn't a scalable approach entirely. Um, so a little bit on what we're doing now um, and the way we've addressed how do we, how do we go from 100 clients to 1,000 clients um, without, with, and still keep some of these basic principles that, that we use to make sure that we knew uh, what our clients were thinking um, and and how best to to interact with them so uh, so we still keep a bit of it uh, new people that join the company and don't don't have enough experience uh, we make sure that they do uh, spend enough time in the field to to uh, really learn how things work in the field uh, another thing that we did so the biggest change we made in this year was to build a strong MIS. And this is a bit of a map of, of what all the, all the technology we use. Um, and this is so that we can uh, keep track of how our clients are doing, how they're performing on the spot. And that way we can monitor very closely and make sure that we make the necessary changes before things go, go too far wrong. Um, I think, uh, of course, there's when we do have a new change that we want to roll out, we trial it in the field, make sure that it makes sense uh, pilot it in a small area, and then we roll it out. Um, I'm getting the, the one minute mark, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up pretty quickly. Uh, there's, there's just some things that, uh, that we, uh, what can I say? There's some things that we continually see in the field that we don't expect. And those things, I think, are kind of impossible to map out from the beginning. But if you really work closely with your clients, you can continually adapt and, and make the changes as you go. 
So I'll leave it at that, and then hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some questions later. Thanks. Okay, so the next um, uh, panelist is Lauren Thomas um, from Mozambiques, uh, which is a company focusing on building a bicycle um, industry that provides affordable and efficient transportation to improve lives in rural Mozambique. Good morning. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, I'm Lauren Thomas, uh, co-founder of Mozambiques. We are based out of Maputo, Mozambique. Um, I will speak very briefly about what we do, just to frame the discussion about market intelligence and then go into uh, the topic. So Mozambiques is a social business that is fighting poverty with bicycles. Um, bicycles are generally accepted as a tool for development. Um, they have a much greater impact in uh, rural Africa, particularly Mozambique, which is a highly fragmented uh, country. Um, and in addition to just putting more bicycles on the street, we are um, working on various models to get bicycles specifically to groups such as women farmers. We're holding workshops on you know, what a bicycle is and how to use it and how to ride it. Um, we are initiating campaigns to increase the safety and conditions of bicycles, just promoting bicycles as something that people should want uh, in general. Um, so this is the motor of the business. How do we get more bicycles on the street is through branding bicycles. This way we're bringing the public and private sector inside of our mission because they are essentially purchasing the branding or purchasing fully branded bicycles. Um, in both cases, people are either getting bicycles at deeply reduced rates or they're getting them for free um, as stakeholders of these branding customers. So they'll give them to their communities uh, for goodwill or to their employees for transport or for bonuses. And we, every time we have a new meeting, we're learning for different uses why a company or an NGO or an organization would want to purchase or brand bicycles. Um, you know, branding is a, is a neat model, I think, for a lot of different products. It's particularly um, useful where there is a lot of value in the branding. So currently in Mozambique, as I mentioned, it's highly fragmented. Uh, Mozambicans were never aggregated into shanty towns and townships and things like that. So the countryside is literally dotted with, with homes of, of rural Mozambicans, and it is traditionally very difficult, if not impossible, to advertise to them as an aggregate 25 million people who are targets for products like flour, seed, uh, microfinance credit, and a whole host of other industries. Um, and so bicycles literally enter their communities. They're around for three to five years, have very high brand uh, loyalty because it's, it's you know, something that they own. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to the various com uh, components of our model. The branding partners are getting CSR, they're getting their advertising, internal transport, for whatever reason they're purchasing the bicycles. Um, the end users are getting reliable, affordable transport, and then the tool for economic advancement, uh, access to education, clean water, uh, health. And the community is getting a clean form of transport, which will hopefully avoid the, the trend of many cities moving into with traffic and congestion. Um, and then, you know, Mozambique is also doing a lot of safety campaigns, cultural events, which are, um, which are great for the community as well. Um, you know, uh, just to reiterate how effective and how important a bicycle is in rural Africa, you know, some of these pictures I think uh, highlight that point. So the topic of market intelligence. Um, I wanted to give a few statistics just to frame the conversation because Mozambique is a very different country from Uganda and Kenya and Ghana and these other countries that we hear a lot about because they're going through a lot of, you know, uh, really kind of sexy technologies right now. Uh, Mozambique has 25 million people, almost half are living below the poverty line, less than $2 per day. Mobile penetration, including Maputo, the capital city, is 32%, but outside Maputo, or without Maputo, is only 10%. Um, internet usage, just above 4%, and then to put it in terms that we can all understand, um, less than 1% are on Facebook. Um, so a lot of these SMS technologies, surveys, mobile health, it just doesn't apply in Mozambique yet. So, to, you know, 
what kind of information did we need when we're going out to uh, develop our business model? Uh, a lot about you know how we would price it, the different specifications uh, of the bicycles, the products, uh, the value for the advertising consumers. This is all the type of market intelligence that we found valuable. And how did we get that? Um, uh, you know. I think a lot of our points may seem a bit intuitive. Um, they're not as sophisticated as some of the other things that we'll hear on the panel, but I think that they're important all the same. The first one is just going out and talking to people. When we first investigated why there were not more bicycles in Mozambique, because you know it, it seems it, it, we were almost naive, like oh, you know, people all over ride bicycles. Why don't you in Mozambique? And the answer was simply that. Uh, very, very low quality bicycles were being sold for high prices because transport costs uh, make very low, cheap product expensive at the end of the day. So you have this really kind of crappy product that's still too expensive for people. So everything was wrong with the fundamentals of the market. Um, get insight from and feedback from those with communications. So we talk a lot with NGOs, with really, really small rural partners. Um, very small NGOs, orphanages, churches, they're there and they're really willing to give you lots of feedback. Um, like I said, every meeting that we have, they have different ideas about why they need bicycles or why they would need to get a message out into the rural market. And the more we learn about their model, we also make a lot of suggestions about how we could um, form a program together. Work with statistics that do exist. Um, you know, when we think about our target market, we generally use a funnel because you know, there's, there's no statistic out there for, you know, number of women that walk more than two and a half hours per day that are producing a product that's too heavy for them to carry, you know. So we work backwards and we start with the population and, uh, you know, take out a certain age group, take out, um, you know, certain people with capabilities, uh, estimates on how many bicycles are out there in the market, and we back into, um, you know, where we believe to be an average uh, number of bicycles for Mozambique of about 1.7 million. Um, while it's never going to be perfect, it helps us understand that it's not 25 million and it's not 500. So, um, uh, and then the last point is, you know, we started in the shallow end. We do a lot of market testing. Uh, we started with one model, one bicycle. Uh, and as we have rolled that out into the market, we've found a lot of ways where that needs to be changed. And our container that's arriving in December will have 18 changes from the previous bicycle. None aesthetic. You wouldn't even know it's a different bicycle. It's more teeth in the crank and, you know, things like that. Uh, and that's how we evolve with our existing product. And then with the uh, IAP, we were just selected um, in this past uh, funding. Uh, and we will be launching new products, so bicycle ambulances, bicycle trailers, and similarly we'll be using all the intelligence that we've got from our first bicycle, um, but also we'll be rolling that out slowly with a few models to, to see what really works. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. Um, we'll continue with, um, with Macarand, um, representing CropServe, uh, which is a company uh, also based here in Zambia, uh, focused on supporting, sorry, focused on developing sustainable um, distribution models to supply small-scale farmers with affordable and high-quality uh, agro inputs. Please. Hi, uh, morning everybody. Uh, I'm Makran, Makran Sorte. I represent CropServe. Uh, due to the time constraints, I mean, Cecilia has warned us, but uh, I need to take you a bit brief back that how we came to it is, uh, we are a <coughs> subsidiary of a company called as United Phosphorus. And uh, uh, our uh, founders uh, are the uh, the MD had a vision of creating a model of called as Unimarts, which will be one-stop shop for the farmers, especially looking into small-scale sector, that is small-scale farmers. And uh, about some four years back, uh, when we really started studying the small-scale sector of Zambia, small-scale farmers, we realized that uh, the yields which they are getting <coughs> from their maize uh, was uh, too low. I mean, it was 1.6 on average, as compared to other countries where uh, Egypt may be ranking to 11 tons per hectare. That is the national average. And then we thought that uh, 
there is a lot of work to be done in this sector. And uh, then we started thinking how to start with. Because reaching small-scale farmers in Zambia, I mean, they're scattered all over. Uh, they might be in interiors with a group of 15 or 25. And so it was not cost effective for us to reach. And uh, that is when we came in touch with uh, uh, another NGO called as DAPP, D-A-P-P, which are into a lot of activities, especially on BOP. And one of their segment was agriculture. So these guys are basically running farmer schools, uh, which helped us to connect to the farmers and train the volunteers of DAP to do demos for the chemicals, agrochemicals, for sustainable agriculture. Now, we worked in it into for one and a half years. And after that, uh, the next challenge came is, OK, now the farmers are aware that, yes, the technology, the yields can go up. But how the availability of products are going to come in? And that is where another now thinking started for our company. And that is where I came in touch with Andrew. Uh, which is the country manager, and we started discussing about it. And uh, then he came up with the project, okay, uh, we need to develop a chain of agro-dealers which are into the rural areas among the farmers. And then, uh, with help of uh, BIF, we started developing this agro-dealers with partnering uh, another firm called as NutriAid, which is an organization uh, into identifying these agro-dealers who can be a potential entrepreneur for the future. And uh, that is how we started all this operation. And then uh, another habit uh, of the Zambian farmers, or the Zambians in particular, we can say we observed is about the buying decision, what we call it as. Then we realized that uh, usually how they work is uh, as soon as the FRA pays, that is the food reserve agencies to the farmers, they don't have a habit of saving saving their money. As soon as they have money, they need to go and buy out. And if you miss that time, then you miss the whole opportunity. And that's where we thought, no, the agro-dealers needs to be there with the products available at that point of time. And that is how we started developing them. And I think now we have developed about 30 agro-dealers overall Zambia. And we are still developing them. The next challenge is about when we are trying to grow these agro-dealers, uh, they have a constraint of finance. So that is where, again, uh, we had a meeting with Zanaiko and other guys where Andrew and I myself are working together to finance agro-dealers. And I think once that uh, challenge is resolved, uh, these agro-dealers are going to develop more and more, and which will help us to reach the smallest farmer. That's how it is, right? So that's it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and the final uh, panelist, uh, Bas Hoffman from text to change um, which is an organization that focuses on mobile market research, uh, providing insights to help uh, both NGOs in their programming work, um, as well as um, companies to better understand their customers' um, preferences and attitudes. Um, and text to change is based in Uganda. Please, Bas. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bas Hufman. Uh, I'm the founder and director of text to change uh, In 2006, I was working for NG, uh, ING Bank in Amsterdam, and uh, I learned about the enormous growth of mobile technology in Africa. And uh, I thought, if so many people have a mobile phone, why don't we reach out with this technology to people with health messages? And I thought it was a crazy idea, and I did some research on that, and I realized, hey, it wasn't done the way we pictured it, like an interactive health quiz. And that's why we founded text to change We got our first uh, uh, grant from uh, the pharmaceutical company, Merck, Sharp & Dome, and they recommended us to go to Uganda and to execute the, the first large-scale M-Health uh, campaign. And... Um, Everything went wrong. <laughs> That's always the, the, the good thing. So but we, we learned a lot. Um, so, but that's how Texture Change was, was founded. So, but the demographic landscape in Africa is changing. Uh, consumer patterns are changing. Um, 
but Africa is booming, but it's also very diverse. Uh, NGOs need to show the impact, so they've been receiving a lot of funding for the years, but now they really have to show the funding, so there's uh, the, the impact, so the pressure is quite high, but also the market has become very competitive. So there is a strong need of good quality data, um, but it's, it's often not available. Household surveys are, um, are, are usually outdated. So it's very important for uh, NGOs and organizations to know, so who are your cu customers actually? So how do they think, how do they behave, and more importantly, how to reach them? Um, but there are 600 uh, mobile phone subscribers, 600 million mobile phone subscribers in, in, uh, in Africa. So we, we decided to use that as a platform to, to, uh, to gather market intelligence and to, uh, to, to avail it as a platform so that uh, clients can engage with their target audience on, an, uh, on a personal level. So since 2008, we have been doing that in 15 countries in Africa. Uh, and mobile is obviously very suitable because it's, it's cost effective, it's, it's reliable, and, it's, um, and you, you got a really uh, nearly real-time information. So the first program I just uh, mentioned, so it was the, the HIV AIDS quiz. We had a response rate of 40%, uh, uh, 20%, and we had an uptake of people going for testing uh, at our partnering clinics of 40%. So that really uh, um, encouraged us to, to continue with this. Uh, but as I said, a lot of things went wrong. One of the things I would like to mention is that uh, we had the answering code, the USSD code, uh, for people to send back their answers. It was initially 666, uh, and in a highly, highly religious country such as Uganda, it was quite uh, challenging that, you, yeah, so we became the, the, the devil's advocate rather than the, uh, the, the HIV AIDS uh, awareness program. But the partnering um, uh, um, um, mobile operator said it's no problem, this one is available, but yeah, we know, we all know why it was available. Um, so five years down the road, we've done like over 70 projects uh, and we're working in seven, uh, 17 countries. We have 28 employees. And we're not only servicing NGOs, but we're also trying to uh, engage with the, uh, the private sector. And that's where the uh, Innovations Against Poverty came in. They're funding our projects. It's called Research Africa. And we thought if we have that platform for NGOs, why don't we avail it to to the, uh, the private sector as well and, and, um, and perform uh, market research. So how does it work? So we create panels, mobile panels, so we have a database of over 20 million uh, mobile subscribers and we start data mining them and profiling them and um, we invite people to participate in surveys of giving their opinions or opinion polls and we uh, reward them with airtime or mobile money. and. Um, and so far, we've uh, profiled database in Uganda, which is a nationwide representative panel of around 3,000 people. So, uh, <coughs> so as I said, we incentivize people. So the short time, uh, the short term social impact is that people get incentives. So they, they yeah, add, they spend around 10 to 12 percent of their income on um, on airtime. So it's a very valuable incentive. And in the end, or in the in the long run, we. Um, yeah, we, we get feedback so uh, people can incorporate it in, in policies but also uh, can use that uh, to, to make tailor-made products for the BOP market. So the lessons we learned, so there's enormous potential for, for a good quality near-time data. Uh, market research is relatively new, um, so although the, the, the more established companies are already there but it's still very new and people don't want to invest in that as such. Uh, we have high response rates as compared to other campaigns or other uh, research efforts. Um, and as for now, the NGOs are still our largest uh, client group, but the private sector is really coming in as it is becoming more uh, competitive. Um, still, we need to combine it with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, data collection and also combine it with the uh, traditional media such as radio, which is still immense popular. Um, you have to take the cultural differences into account, so it's like uh, 54 different countries in Africa. Even in Uganda, you already have like, yeah, 40 different languages. Um, and it's hard to find good quality personnel in, in Uganda for us to that have really... Um, um, 
good knowledge about market research. So, and it's also very challenging for us to keep our panel alive, so you have to have a lot of service to, um, to keep people uh, engaged and to not create a fatigue. Um, so what we're going to do in 2014, so we are going to use the panel we already have and start marketing it and, and focus more on sales. And we are expanding to uh, neighboring countries. We've already done programs in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, these are a few of our clients and thank you very much. Thank you, Bas. Um, I thought we would um, spend the last 10-15 um, minutes on um, questions for the panelists and, and also it would be also fantastic if, if the audience would like to share insights and experiences when it comes to, to the obstacles uh, that we have talked about uh, to gain insight uh, about the BOP. Um, maybe some strategies for collecting such information um, and, um, and, and how to, to sort of overcome these, these challenges. Um, so I open the floor uh, for questions. It's more of an observation than a question. Um, at IDE, we do a lot of human-centered design, and the, the speaker from uh, Delight mentioned it. It is such a hugely valuable tool. It's mainly qualitative, and it's really getting under the skin of your customer, and it saves you a huge amount of failing later. You fail early, fail often, rapid prototype, go out there, find out what your customers think about your product, before you you're even think about production of the product. So I'd be very happy to talk to people who are interested more about, about that, but we have come to that. We partnered with IDEO um, to develop a human-centered design toolkit for organizations working in development. And it is, it's such a fantastic um, technique to use um, to find out more about your customers and um, avoid failing at a later stage. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Michael from the Stockholm School of Economics, and I just have one question for the panelists, um, especially thinking of markets, uh, maybe more also for you from, from Mozambique. Um, how do you measure the impact you have on your market, especially when you think of advertisements and your clients, and maybe also for the other pounds as well? The impact in the market is something that interests me. Thank you. Monitoring and evaluation is always a huge topic uh, because it is so difficult. So how do we start doing that? It's a very good question. Um, we try to collect as much data on the end users of the bicycles as possible. Um, the, the bicycles that get donated, it's very easy because we have a very scrutinous process to give those bicycles away. So we have a lot of information on them. Um, this year, we have also gotten some funding from USAID with the explicit purpose of launching a monitoring and evaluation, social impact annual report, um, and we're hiring uh, social uh, impact consultancy advisors to do that. So I won't say that it's easy and we just fell into it. Um, we are bringing in outside help uh, that will help us design the monitoring plan, uh, make sure that we're not getting over our skis and trying to collect too many indicators at any one time, um, that we are reaching out to the right people. So we'll be implementing with the branding bicycle clients. Uh, when they purchase bicycles with us, they'll fill out a, a short survey of the exact provinces where the bicycles will be going to, for what purpose, you know, and, and so we'll be able to get some insight there into how the bicycles will be used, which will also then help us understand the impact that they'll have. Um, but this whole process will be developed over the course of an entire year, and then we'll put out our first report and hopefully constantly keep that updated. Thanks. Um, in, in, in our space, uh, well, generally, I think collaboration is a, is a, is, is key to, to scale up. Um, and in our space, in the lighting space, and I don't think there's a lot of collaboration that happens, and it should. Um, this is 
question particularly to Lauren and to, to Boss. I mean, in the in the in, in your case, Lauren, there you know there's um, World Bicycle Relief that I think is also operating here in Zambia. Uh, have you guys started to look at collaborative efforts with them? And then in in Boss's case, you know, the UNICEF and has their own SMS-based platform in Uganda. Um, Telerivit. There's a whole bunch of other SMS-based platforms. Is there any collaboration happening in, in your space? Oh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so in Uganda, so back in 2007, seven, eight, when we started, was relatively new. And now there are, there are many, many platforms that are basically doing the same or, um, or could do the same. Um, collaboration is, is there, but it's also very competitive. So um, we, we wanted to work with UNICEF on a, you know, on a larger scale or with other organizations, but we've proven, uh, we've, yeah, it has proven to be quite challenging to, to work together. Um, it, it seems that every organization wants to own their own platform, and as much as we are all um, chasing or uh, pursuing the same goal, it's, um, it's quite a competitive market, so, yeah. It, it happens, but it's, it's yeah, they're reinventing the wheel is, is, is quite common. Um, I think we had a question over here. Oh, oh sorry, no. No, no so go okay. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to uh, touch on your point. So we have been in contact with World Bicycle Relief, but the models, even though they might seem really similar, that we are, you know, selling a bicycle rather than just giving them away, models are really different different because we um, are very intensive on the ground. Uh, when we bring in the components, it's nut and bolt and spoke, and we do everything locally to give more jobs in Mozambique, and we paint and we brand the bicycles locally. And World Bicycle Relief does uh, less in terms of the technical capacity on the ground because their bicycles are all the same. They're not doing the branding. Um, and so then we have the advertising component, and they don't. So where we would overlap is really just in trying to, um, I guess, market. Uh, the product to the end users, which we don't have to do that much because once we have the branding revenues, the product costs about $30. So there's, our marketing is more to the branding clients rather than to the end users. That's for us is the easy part. Hi, my name is Andrew from uh, the ATMS project of the UNDP. My interest to the panelists is to understand how you effectively build in um, scale for financial sustainability. Uh, logically, in the first three to five years, you're getting a lot of money from USID, IAP, and all the other interested partners who would love to get this social inclusion going. Um, but effectively, once that funding starts to, to wind down, how do you ensure that you have a long-term uh, platform to, to get your business financially sustainable. I'm looking at the issue of Mozambique and looking at um, the Ugandan situation. Uh, over time, say over the next 10 years, <clears throat> we've had a lot of conflict in the northern Uganda. As we speak, uh, you look at the trend of um, donor aid going down, and that means many NGOs are closing down or scaling down activity. That is your core customer. Where is the financial sustainability? Yes, uh, thanks for your question. So um, the reason why we started the initiative uh, Research Africa was actually to service the, the private sector too because we are, we're also seeing that the donor funding uh, was going down. At the same time, there's, uh, there's more demand for... Um, a monitoring and evaluation or, or impact assessment of, of the, uh, the efforts of NGOs. So in the coming years, um, we see that, that most probably the NGOs will still be uh, a predominant part of our uh, clientele, but we will use the platform to, for impact assessments as opposed to social marketing. But um, we really think that in the coming years the, the private sector companies will take the overhand uh, in view of more organizations from, uh, from the West are coming in in Africa to, uh, to launch their services. So we will become um, 
a market research company, or and we also see that there is a demand from the, the, the already established market research companies that don't have that mobile component yet, and we become their assistant service, so to speak. So um, the, the shift from NGOs, uh, private sector, but also um, the existing market research company that, that hire us. So I think the sustainability part is uh, been taken care of. Hi, um, I'm Michael from Tugende, and we finance motorcycle taxi drivers in Uganda to own their own motorcycles. Um, and so one thing we've been thinking about a lot is actually branding. Right now we don't brand the motorcycles because we're afraid of what one really bad driver riding one of our motorcycles can do to our entire company um, brand-wise. So I'd love to hear from everybody except Boss about how you guys think about brand risk. So for rent to own, uh, what happens if you know, your, your equipment is faulty because you got a bad shipment? And uh, for the fertilizer, what if one of your market agents dilutes it? And then, yeah, for, for the bicycles, what, what goes into making sure that the end user, um, I mean, I don't know how recklessly you can drive a bicycle, but let's say you're a terror on the road, uh, you know, that could do damage to the brand that's paying uh, for the bicycle. So I'd love to hear how you guys think about that. Um, because it's something we're totally avoiding right now. Yeah. Um, I, so for us, it's not a huge concern in terms of the equipment uh, not performing. Uh, we do guarantee our equipment, and we do once in a while have one or two pieces that is faulty. We replace it. Um, that's not a big part of it. I think... Uh, the risk for us comes with who we work with, like in terms of our agents. So if we, if we make a mistake during the agent recruitment and we find someone who uh, isn't a good representative of the company um, and acts yeah, in a way that we don't want them to, then that's definitely a risk. So uh, for us, it's, uh, it's more uh, checking the character of the, of the agents that we do work with. So um, possibly that could work on your end as well, getting character references and that sort of thing. Uh, I think uh, he's right. Uh, usually uh, what we are most probably bothered is about the representatives who represent our brand or the company because uh, in past we had experienced the same thing where some of the representatives uh, get involved into counterfeit products where your brands are involved. And uh, as it's a chemical business for us, uh, it's, it's risky if something goes wrong. And then we are responsible for it. So we, we are really uh, very keen, and that's why we are partnered with Nutriaid, where they authenticate the representative for us. That's how it is. Um, just to wrap up your question, we also don't necessarily have um, the exact issue that, that you're discussing with bicycles. Bicycles are so valuable that, um, you know, if, if, if there was a bicycle that lost a component and the person couldn't use it anymore, they wouldn't just leave it laying in their yard, uh, tarnishing the brand image. They would probably sell and, and get what they could for it, so it would be reused into a new bicycle. Um, but just, I, I would give you a few tips that, that we've learned along the way. Um, when it comes to incorporating branding into your model, um, make sure that you really think about it before you get started because obviously you'll use a lot of overhead or even just your time which is valuable when you're thinking about it. Um, in Mozambique they started to put branding on push carts which bring around fruit and you know variety of other of other items. They're just you know pretty large carts about this big that a, you know a young kid walks around pushing in the more rural area and that failed because Ultimately, the advertisers were paying a lot of money. Um, there wasn't a business that was really economizing the advertisements. They were paying these kids individually. They wanted a lot of money. They thought they deserved a lot of money. Um, and the ground that they were covering in a given period of time was so little, plus they weren't cleaning their carts. There was, there was a lot of failures with it. And after just a few months, they pulled out, even though in theory, these push carts have a lot of space in the urban area. So the idea was there, but it didn't work. Um, so you have to really make sure that there's a lot of value to the advertiser, that there's value to you, that, that all the components are in place. 
Um, hi, uh, Tim from Zanrec. Um, this is maybe more a discussion point or an observation. Um, I think everyone is going out there and, and doing their own piece of marketing and they're, they're targeting their, their groups. And uh, obviously marketing information that you gather is, is a valuable uh, resource and tool. I was just wondering if there is a, a way or a forum or somehow to kind of get a, a meta database of all the, the maybe the basic information that people have that, that allows uh, starting businesses, NGOs to maybe take a lot of the overhead cost out of their initial kind of assessment or if that's something that might be viable. I don't know. It's just a, a, an idea. If that makes sense, I can try and clarify any more. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't really have any any um, short answer to that. Is is anyone in the panel um, want to to uh, reflect on that? Yeah. It does does sound like a lovely idea, and I think that we would value that type of information that would be available. Um, in general, information is really expensive, and so it would have to be uh, donor funded, or it would have to, and you know, a lot of those are in specific programs that have end dates, and so there would certainly be hurdles in keeping that up to date year over year over time, because it seems like the type of company that would start that would sell it. Um, yeah. I think we have time for one last question. The gentleman in, in the front? Yes, please. Um, I'm Silo Messi. I come from Kaluri Development Foundation based in Sinazongwe, southern province of Zambia. I just wanted to make a comment, especially on the rent to own. To say maybe you might think your business has no customers, but if you traveled around the country and you talk to people like us, our NGO, which is based by the lake, there is a lot of potential which I can see for your products, like those engines which I saw. We have about more than 1,500 fishing vessels which use that type of machines which you have. So if you can come and then we talk, we introduce you to the people, you can even have a presentation with those people, I think you can break even. Then coming back to motor bikes, yes, indeed I've seen the impact of your, motor, your bicycles. I happened to do some work in an Ampula area there, and then I saw a lot of bicycles, especially in the mornings. But the only problem which I saw is that, yes, you are trying to introduce quite a very nice product on the market, but at the same time, the people who are using the product are exposed to danger. The safety element, I saw that it was really lacking in Mozambique. Be it bicycle users or motorbike users, they have no helmets, they are also using the same roads. I remember one of the taxi drivers which I used even saying, this gentleman is not paying tax, so he's not supposed to use this road. So I don't know whether there were any other discussions which were held maybe with the government to make sure that the safety aspect also comes in, like having maybe the side tracks for those bicycles and like them being crowded within the tarred roads which are being used by motorists. There is a lot of fights taking place within. Thank you. Well, I love your comment because if I sit here and talk about all the hurdles, um, I don't know how it will come across in a, in a presentation, but thank you for just highlighting all of the difficulties that we are facing. Um, that's why what we're doing at Mozambikes is so much more than just selling bicycles. We are focusing a lot on safety campaigns, which starts from education, how to you know take care of your bicycle so the wheel doesn't pop off, teaching cars how to share the road. Um, we've got an illustrator working on a cartoon campaign with different lessons of you know how to use the bicycle and ride safety uh, safely. This year, we're pitching um, just a study, an engineering study, topographic study on how we could put the first phase one of a bicycle lane network into Maputo. So we're doing a lot of different things. There are so many challenges. I'd love to get more of your feedback from your visit in Nampula. Yeah, um, yeah I'll just quickly respond. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, de most definitely we, uh, I, we've seen potential for the fishing communities as well along Lake Kariba in Zambia. Um, we've spent a lot of our time in the last year building our foundation so that we can expand and grow um, across Zambia and, and, and even into other countries. So uh, it's definitely on our map. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, and, and thank you all for, for participating, uh, for your interaction, and thanks to the panelists. I, I hope that we've come um, some steps uh, towards uh, addressing challenges when it comes to uh, um, understanding the BOP market. Um, well, it's, it's, it's lunchtime, so uh, I invite everyone to, um, to go and have lunch. Uh, it is, um, if you go into the lobby and then keep to the, uh, to the right, you'll find uh, the room for lunch um, further in there. Uh, and I do encourage you to go visit the, the um, exhibition as well during the lunch hour. And please be back at 10 past one so that we can start uh, promptly. Thank you so much.